Okay, hi, this is Mr. Coffs. I'm gonna do crash course. Oh no! Oh no! I'm gonna do I'm gonna do crash course steps to the American Revolution and we had some technical problems. Okay, we're back in action. Let's hope this doesn't fall. So I'm gonna use this back here to annotate on this no signal board, which is a black space. So the American Revolution, a lot of historians say, wasn't really a revolution, it was more of an evolution. And what that means is, it didn't just happen like some historians think it did, it happened over a series of time, even over decades, maybe even a century, that the seeds go back to even Bacon's rebellion, potentially, where we see an example of colonial resistance to royal authority. But a lot of historians will tell you that it's really the Great Awakening of the 1740s with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield that were the seeds of the, the, the American Revolution because the Great Awakening uh, gave people this whole that they could study the Bible on their own and not lean on the minister. And then 20 years later, the defiance was in their mind against King George III in Great Britain. So when salutary neglect ends after the Seven Years' War in 1763, it ends because Britain's broke, then we start to see a series of ways that the British crown is trying to generate revenue from the colonies. And it starts really uh, with the proclamation line of 1763, which King George III says you can't cross the Appalachian Mountains because he sees that as a barrier. Uh, that when they cross it, that they have provoking and fighting with American Indians, and he's sick of the fighting with the American Indians because it costs the crown money. The colonists are very defiant and angry. Then we see a tax called the Sugar Act, which is a tax on sugar in 1764, an indirect tax, but nevertheless led to some hostility, some petitions, and some boycotts. And then we see a couple quartering acts happen because he wants the troops to be able to, he wants the troops to be able to have, Parliament wants the troops in George III to have, be able to have lodging and to have food while they're here because it's expensive. And they're sort of taking over colonists' rich and fancy houses, which leads to resentment. In 1765, we also see the very important Stamp Act the Stamp Act was a tax on legal documents, uh, a tax on playing cards and other printed materials. This caused really a firestorm and it led to a lot of colonists questioning what are really our rights. And it wasn't just rich people or lawyers, it was colonists from all walks of life that are starting to ask, can they do this? Can our government do this? And the rally cry of no taxation without representation in parliament becomes the rally cry of colonial America without representation. Okay, so they repeal the Stamp Act. It gets repealed. See that? And then they pass something called the Declaratory Act, which declares they can do whatever they want. Parliament can do whatever they want. And what they want is Charles Townshend and the Townshend duties, which is... In 1767 attacks on lead, glass, tea, and paper, the Townshend duties. This led to more resentment and more fighting, petitions, letters to the editor, in newspapers, boycotts, and really a general resentment, particularly in Boston, but really starting to build momentum throughout colonial America. Then in 1770, Paul Revere paints the famous print to depict the Boston Massacre where five colonists were killed. It was provoked by colonists, but it was blamed particularly on the British government for killing, much like the Kent State killings with the National Guard in Ohio that uh, Neil Young wrote lyrics to in, in, in that famous song, Four Dead in Ohio. This was, you know, five dead in Boston, and it was really literally uh, 200 years earlier than that. And it led to a firestorm throughout colonial America, which led really to a period of calm because I think Great Britain knew that they really messed this up. And so for a few years, things are quiet. Uh, the colonists are resentful for this ship, the Gatsby, and they send, uh, they dress up as Native Americans 
and they, they set the ship afire and there's consequence for that. And then the Tea Act. Uh, Britain wants to sell their British East India tea. We've been complaining about tea tax since the Townshend duties. So they think, hey, we're going to give them cheaper tea. But the colonists didn't want to drink this tea. They found it really oppressive. And they dressed as Native Americans. And they dumped the tea in the Boston Harbor, which forever becomes known as the Boston Tea Party, which is a response to the Tea Act of 1763 or 1773. Uh, and that led directly to what are known as the Intolerable Acts, because they wouldn't tolerate them, which included the Coercive Acts of Boston under martial law and even the Quebec Act, which dealt with controlling Canada and scared the colonists in America. Uh, this led to the first Continental Congress in 1774, where they met to restore things the way they were before salutary neglect ended. And then eventually they decided they'd meet again in 1775. At the same time, Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense which is a pamphlet that basically said, duh, why would this little island control this large, self-sufficient natural resource landmass in the Atlantic Ocean away? The satellite shouldn't control the planet. Duh, it's common sense. A lot of American colonists read that. And during 1775, the war itself breaks out. Uh, but it's really a rebellion where Britain's trying to suppress it. There's the first true battle of Bunker Hill, which is two months after Lexington and Concord. And essentially, there's battles being fought throughout a year while these founding fathers are in Philadelphia deliberating should they actually do the unthinkable and break away from Great Britain, which eventually Jefferson will write a document and they will argue about it and they will edit it and they will critique it and then they will sign it on July 4th. 1776. Those are the steps to revolution.